Catholic Apologetics Today, Part 4. Chapter 13, The Inner Circle. And it happened in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray, and passed the entire night in the prayer of God. And when the day came, he called himself to his disciples, and those twelve of them, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who is Zelotes, and Jude, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Luke, chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. Thus, St. Luke tells of the choosing of the twelve. Mark has a very similar account, chapter 3, verse 13 through 19, and Matthew, chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. We notice that twelve were chosen out of those who were already in a circle of disciples. They were to be more closely united with him to form his inner circle, so to speak. After this point in the gospel narrative, we constantly hear about the apostles being with him. The gospels prove we would expect to find an inner circle of some sort in the crowds that followed after him. Also, we would expect that he would speak more to his inner circle and tell them things more fully than he would to the general crowd. That, too, is evident in the Gospels. Especially significant, however, is the line in Mark chapter 4, verse 1. See also Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, and Luke chapter 8, verse 10. To you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to those outside all things are in parables. The arrangement St. Mark had made, we know the evangelists did not always use chronological order. This passage comes right after the tragic incident in which he had cast out a devil. But the scribes commented, Mark chapter 3 verse 22, he has Belzebub, and the prince of devil he cast out devils. This was, as Jesus himself said, the unforgivable sin. Mark chapter 3, verse 28, 29. Not that God would refuse to forgive any repentant sinner any sin, but rather such hardness is extremely unlikely ever to soften the point of repentance. And without repentance, not even God who is mercy itself, will forgive. In fact, forgiveness is simply impossible without repentance. For the sinner who is unrepentant says, in effect, I was right to sin and to offend you. Consequently, it was after this that, as St. Mark presents it, Jesus resorted to using parables as a teaching method. But, for the apostles, he would still explain things. Hence he added, To you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those outside, all things are in parables. And mysteriously he continued, That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear but not understand, lest any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Mark chapter 4 verse 11 Luke chapter 8 verse 10 has similar language seeming to imply that the purpose of the parables is to prevent outsiders from understanding Matthew chapter 13 verse 13 to 15 has a softer version of the same Therefore do I speak of them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, and neither do they understand. And the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in them, who said, You shall really hear, but not understand, and really look, but not see. 
All three Gospels report Jesus quoting the same passage of Isaiah. There, God had just appointed Isaiah as a prophet, and he tells him in the form of a command, Go, and thou shalt say to this people, Really hear, but do not understand, and really see, but do not perceive. Make thick the heart of the people, and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their own eyes and hear with their ears and understand with the heart and turn and be healed. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. Did not Jesus want people in general to hear his message? Obviously he did. Otherwise, why would he go to such labors? Why then did he make these statements? Obviously, we need to investigate to find out. It is a well-known Semitic speech patterns with Westerners cannot understand without help. Often, in fact, most of the time, the Hebrews would speak through, as through God positively did and intended all things which he really only permitted. For example, in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh's heart was hardened several times even after he had seen the displays of mighty power by Moses and Aaron. Yet Exodus chapter 10 verse 1 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may work these signs on him. Obviously, God does not want men to be hard. Men harden themselves. Even more dramatically, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3, after the Philistines had infected a great defeat on the Israelites, they said, Why has the Lord struck us today before the face of Philistines? Of course the Israelites knew it was the Philistines who had struck them, yet they said God did it. Hence, in the way the Gospels depict Jesus quoting Isaiah, and the original text of First Samuel as well, when we find an expression that says God intended to close their eyes and ears so they would not repent, we should recognize the Hebrew pattern we have just explained and understand that the real meaning is that God has permitted, not caused, the hardening. Therefore, Jesus did not want to blind his hearers. Rather, in Matthew chapter 23, 37, Jesus weeps over the hardness. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered together your children, as the hen gathers her chickens and under her wings, and you would not? Again, after the parable of the wedding dinner, when most of those invited not only refused to attend, but even killed the servants who called them, he sadly added, For many are called, but few have chosen. Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. St. Matthew observes, Matthew chapter 21, verse 45, that the Pharisees understood that the parable just before the one about the wicked tenants meant them, so they would understand that the wedding feast parable meant the same. Now the meaning of many are called is clear. He called all Pharisees and all others of his people to the wedding feast, to the messianic kingdom. But most of them were not chosen because they refused to come. Thus, Jesus did want his people to understand, but he found many of them so ill-possessed he turned to parables. Later on, the apostles, especially St. Paul, would find people better disposed and would be able to speak more openly. There has been much discussion about the purpose of the parables. Were they meant to show mercy or as blinding injustice? The real answer is that they were both at the same time. They were such a device that those with good dispositions would understand at least something at the start and would grow in understanding, while the ill-disposed would understand less and less. 
Thus, there really is a spiral pattern set up in two opposite directions by the parable, and in many other things in Scripture as well. They began to see the spirals. We will think of a man who has never been drunk before, but goes out and really gets drunk. The next morning he has a grand hangover, but also guilty feelings. Since this is a case in which the man has never been drunk before, and after that first spree there will be a clash of two voices inside him, the voice of his beliefs say it is very wrong to get drunk. The voice of his actions, which speak more loudly than words, says it is all right. Our nature dislikes such classes and works hard to eliminate them. So, in due time, something has to give. Either the man makes his actions fit his faith, or his faith will fit his actions. That is, if he continues in his pattern of drunkenness, he will reach a point at which he no longer believes it very wrong to get drunk. His faith had been forced into line with his actions, and he can go further down the spiral, and for others' beliefs are interlocked with the belief of the evil of drunkenness. So in time he can be very dull indeed in perceiving any religious truths, he had gone far on a downward spiral, which feeds only on itself, making his mind darker and darker towards the truth. But there is a spiral in the other direction as well. Faith tells us that this world is compared to the next, is worth very little. St. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he even dares to speak of all things, of the world as dung, in comparison to the things of eternity. So, if a man lives vigorously in accord with such faith, he will continue going farther and farther into the spiral in the good direction. His ability to perceive religious truths will become greater and greater. There is both mercy and justice in both spirals. The evil man deserves his blindness. It is due injustice, and yet there is mercy for him in this, because the more deeply one knows the truths of faith, the greater his responsibility. The man of faith, on the other hand, deserves the added light, and so receives it justice. Yet the fact that he gets it is most basically mercy. All gifts of God to us are, at bottom, mercy. We cannot, by our own power, generate any claim to him. We return to the parables and scripture. They are designed to point out a distinction among people, those well disposed, who will get more and more of the light, those ill disposed who will lose even what they seem to have, Recall the line at the end of the parable of the talents. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will abound. But from him who has not, even that he was ill, will be taken away. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 29. And, as we saw, there is both mercy and justice in both cases. We can easily see that teaching in parables was splendidly designed to address the best of hardness in his audience, to set up the division based on good with bad dispositions. At the same time, he explained all to his inner circle for use later on with those who would be better disposed. We can see, too, why Jesus did not overwhelm people with miracles. Why did he not arrange to rise from the tomb before several hundred people, including unbelievers, so that the people could not help believing him? The answer is that faith should not be forced. If forced, it is not really faith at all. When we accept things as true, we use compulsive and non-compulsive evidence. Compulsive evidence leaves us with no freedom of choice. For instance, 
2 plus 2 equals 4. Non-compulsive evidence covers a larger spectrum. At the upper end are facts so strongly based that no one can doubt their validity. For example, we know that Washington crossed the Delaware. Again, there is virtually no freedom to decide. But on the other end of the non-compulsive range of evidence, things meet for which there is ample proof, but yet not such proof as to leave us no freedom of choice. Our minds are not forced into believing. Precisely in that range there is freedom, and there is room for faith, and it will be faith in general, as it was with the parables. Those well disposed will see more and more as they grow into holiness. Those ill disposed will see less and less, and they grow in iniquity. We have seen that Jesus did have an inner circle to whom he explained things more clearly, not so much for immediate use, such since the crowds were most, mostly hardened, but for later use. The Gentiles, as St. Paul witnessed repeatedly, would not accept Christ in great numbers. Jesus wanted people to understand, but he did not want to coerce their belief. It is important that people freely choose the truth. Once they believe, grace is abundantly given so they can grow in holiness. Chapter 14 Behold, I am with you all days. We now reach the climax of our search, the proof that the messenger from God told his apostles to teach and promised that God would protect their teaching and that of their successors until the very end of time. In this chapter, we will see the positive proof. In the, in the next chapter, we will answer the chief objections raised to the validity of the foundation of the church. And he went up to a mountain and called those he wanted, and they came to him. And he caused the twelve to be with him, to send them to preach. Thus, Mark chapter 3, verse 13, 14, and Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, Luke chapter 9, verse 2, describes the call of the apostles with their appointments by Jesus to continue his mission of preaching and searching. This was at the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus himself. At the end, after his resurrection, Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, tells about the confirmation and extension of their mission. And Jesus coming spoke to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth, going therefore to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. After Pentecost had calmed their first fears and strengthened them, the apostles went forth fearlessly, teaching the message of Jesus in spite of all the threats of beatings, imprisonment, and death that we see in the Act of the Apostles. Everyone then understood that only the apostles were the official teachers appointed by Jesus, for Acts 5.13 states, But of the rest no man dare join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Paul, too, commissioned by Jesus on the road of Damascus, went out tirelessly preaching, in spite of every kind of obstacle and persecution. He, like other apostles, made provision for him the continuance of the teaching of Jesus. Hence, he left Timothy at Ephesus and wrote to him, These things command and teach, till I come attend to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Take heed 
to yourself and to doctrine. Be earnest in them. For in doing this you will save yourself and those who hear you. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 and 13 verse 16. Still more explicitly in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 to 14 and 2 chapter 2 verse 2. Hold the form of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and that the love in which Jesus and still more explicitly in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 to 14 and chapter 2 verse 2. Hold the form of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and the love which is in Jesus Christ. Keep the good deposit committed to you your trust in the Holy Ghost and the things which you have heard by of me. So many witnesses, the same command to faithful men who shall be fit to teach others also. In the same vein, at the end of the first century, Pope St. Clement I, who was of the same generation as the apostles Peter and Paul, wrote to Corinth, where rebels had dared to oust and supplant the properly appointed successor of the apostles. Our apostles knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife over the name of bishop. As a result, having received full foreknowledge, they had appointed those we have mentioned. Meanwhile, adding a provision that if these would fall asleep which means die, other approved men should receive their ministry. Jesus himself had indicated that the mission he gave to the apostles was not for the one generation only. He made this clear in the words recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And he said, Behold, I am with you all days even to the consummation of the world. He made it clear in other ways too, especially the parables of the weeds and the net. In the first, kingdom of heaven is compared to a field in which the master sowed good seed, but his enemy came at night and sowed weeds in the same field. The servants wanted to pull out of the weeds, but the master said to him, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the whole wheat along with them. He advised, The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are angels. Just as weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the world. So the church with both good and wicked men in it, is to last until the harvest, the end of the world. The same thought is clear in the parable of the net which gathered up fish of every kind. Afterwards, the fishers sorted out the good and the bad fish. So will it be at the end of the world. So, as one would naturally expect, Jesus wanted his teaching by the apostles and their successors to go on to the very end. And one would expect, too, he promised that God would protect the teaching. Really, any sensible leader, if he had the means to do so, would want to protect his organization and see that it would stay faithful to the teachings he imparted to it. Ordinary men cannot make such a provision, but a messenger sent from God could do it, if so God willed. We all know that God did so will, for that messenger made the fact clear more than once. As St. Luke records, Luke chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus told the apostles, He who hears you, hears me, 
and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. That is, he rejects God himself. So Jesus did, as a messenger from God, assure that men in hearing them would hear him, and so in turn would hear God's message. If not, it would be rejecting God who sent him as his messenger. Similarly, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 17 to 18, he told the apostles, And if he will not hear them, tell the church. And if he will not hear the church, let him be to you as heathen and publican. The words that follow make the case even more emphatic and clear. Amen, I say to you, whoever you shall bind upon the earth shall be bound also in heaven, and whoever shall loose upon earth shall be loosed also in heaven. The words binding and loosing were well known in the teaching of the rabbis at that time. Their regular meaning was to impose or remove an obligation by an authoritative decision or teaching. In the verse just quoted, they were spoken of to all the apostles. In the verse just quoted, they were spoken to all the apostles. As we shall see in chapter 16, they were also spoken individually, especially to Peter, Matthew 16, 19. Commenting directly on the commission to Peter, and so indirectly on the same words to all the apostles, W. F. Albright, a noted Protestant scripture scholar, often called in his last years the Dean of American Scripture Scholars, wrote in his commentary on Matthew, Peter's authority to bind or release will be a carrying out of the decisions made in heaven. His teaching and disciplinary activities will be similarly guided by the Spirit to carry out heaven's will. We see, then, the full import of the words Jesus used in his last farewell to the apostles, which we quoted earlier, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Going therefore, teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. Now that we have established that there was a body commissioned by a messenger from God and promised to protect the name of God for its teaching, what is expected from us? Intellectually, it is not only permissible to believe what the body teaches, if one is intelligent enough to follow our proofs, it is not just permissible, it is intellectually inescapable. Thus, Catholics follow that teaching, not out of esteem for the humans who bear the commission. In fact, the first head of the body, Peter, even denied Jesus at his trial. No, Catholics accept that teaching because the apostles and their successors are on the receiving end of his promises. He who hears you hears me. I am with you to the end of the world. Therefore, it is not only rational to have faith, it is intellectually required. It is inescapable intellectually, as we have said. As a result... Now we can ask the same body to clarify many other things for us, to tell us if the messenger might happen to be God himself. We ask it to tell us if the Gospels, and also inspired by the Holy Spirit, besides being ancient documents that pass the same tests other reliable records pass. 
Such assurance is needed, for in the first centuries there were in circulation many alleged gospels and other alleged sacred books. We need to know which really are sacred and inspired. Now we can find out, for the body commissioned by the divine messenger can tell us and has told us. Only in this way do we know that writings constitute the Bible. Anyone who does not accept that divinely given teaching authority really has no logical right to appeal to the Gospels at all as sacred and inspired. How could he know if they are inspired or not? Chapter 15 Kungli Objections in spite of the clear scriptural evidence that we have already presented, some objections have been raised by critics. The strongest come from Hans Kuhn. Kuhn believes, one, Jesus did not found a church during his lifetime. His view was limited. He regarded himself as sent only to the children of Israel. His missionary command is post-paschal. Two, Jesus never required a membership of a church as a condition of entry into God's kingdom. The Dead Sea community insisted on many things. It had a sort of novitiate with many rules, long prayers, ritual meals and baths and regulations. Jesus made no such demands. With him there was, instead, criminal irregularity, casualness, spontaneity, freedom. So he offended the passive world-forsaking aesthetics by his uninhibited worldliness. 3. Hence, in contrast to the fasting of John the Baptist and his followers, for Jesus the sign took the form of feasts held in an atmosphere of joy in which people celebrated their membership in the future kingdom. According to Kung, he expected the end soon. Even the Last Supper was just one more of these meals of celebration. Jesus was having a high time with friends who continued the practice after he died. Kung's views are extreme, but many Catholic scholars do make approaches in varying degrees to Kung's points. First, the question, did Jesus directly found the church and institute the sacraments? For example, Richard McBrien, while not speaking too clearly, seems to say that Jesus did not directly found a church or institute sacraments. To say that Jesus did both of these things would be that McBrien calls non-scholarly conservatism. Our position in this book would be to get that label from McBrien and many others, but we are in good company. The Council of Trent defined that Jesus instituted seven sacraments. In addition, the same council explicitly defined that Jesus instituted the sacrament of penance when he said to the apostles, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you shall forgive. They are forgiven them. John, chapter 20, verse 22. It is likewise to find that Jesus at the Last Supper ordained the apostles in saying, Do this in commemoration of me. Luke, chapter 22, verse 19. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 24. And further defined the specifically that Jesus constituted the sacraments of the annoying, of the sick, and matrimony. In contrast, various scholars like to say that all Jesus did was proclaim the kingdom, gather disciples, give them the Holy Spirit, and later the church developed, and the priesthood developed too, along with it. The chief root of such views in the widespread conviction that Jesus was ignorant did not know enough even about his own work and 
character to lay out what many scholars like to call a blueprint for the future. It further defined specifically that Jesus instituted the sacraments of the anointing of the sick and of matrimony. In contest, various scholars like to say that all Jesus did was to proclaim the kingdom, gather disciples, give them the Holy Spirit, and that later the church developed and the priesthood was developed too, along with it. A chief root of such views is the widespread conviction that Jesus was ignorant, did not know enough about even his own work and character to lay out that many scholars like to call a blueprint for the future. They do not really mean to say that he, the divine person, had any ignorance. They mean that certain things did not, as it were, register on his human mind. In my book, The Consciousness of Christ, I take up and answer every argument given by any scholar of note to prove ignorance in Jesus. The same book also gives all the teachings of the church, which definitely exclude ignorance in the human intellect of Jesus. Some think that Jesus spoke no words at all after Easter. In such a case, he would have communicated with the apostles and others by what mystical theologians call interior locutions. Then the objectors continue. The apostles only later would have come to understand the command to teach all nations, or else this command was never given at all, but was simply a community formulation, something faked. The objectors seemed not to know the real nature of the interior locutions. Actually, in them, the recipients understand well and at once it is only at a later time that the same soul may begin to wonder if it really came from God. So this proposal will not explain why the apostles did not seem at first to have heard the command to teach all nations. Really, the objectors forget over and over again that the Gospels portray the apostles as slow to understand. They did not grasp even the repeated predictions of Christ's death, and therefore seemed to have given up the faith when he died. Even when the women came and reported he had risen, they had difficulty comprehending or believing. Still later, the apostles flunked their final exam just before he ascended. They asked, Lord, will you at this time again restore again the kingdom of Israel? Acts chapter 1 verse 6. It seems they still had not gotten over the notion of a conquering Messiah. How could they fail to grasp? Much brighter, ed better educated people than dull Galilean fishermen have known to fail to grasp things. At the end of the chapter 8, we gave a short note on form and redaction criticism. In it, we saw how Norman Perrin, not an uneducated fisherman, but a highly trained University of Chicago professor of scripture, could fail to see what is so clear. Take, for example, the sad case of Dr. Semmelweis in the middle of the 19th century, who other doctors put away for life in an insane asylum because they could not accept his discovery of the cause of periperal fever. The proof of this claim was accurate and undeniable. His patients often did not get pure peral fever. The rest was so simple. He had used antiseptic precautions. If other doctors had been accustomed to ignoring them, not knowing about germs, they would even come from an autopsy room with blood on their aprons and go right into the delivery room. No wonder germs were passed from patient to patient. 
But the doctors could not see what was right in front of their noses. Again, Tyler de Chardin, a Jesuit priest, painted a glorious picture of the human race as he thought it would be just before the return of Christ. He predicted that all people would be bound together as closely as a, in a totalitarian state. But the bond would be love, and perhaps even telepathy. Yet Chardin, as a Jesuit priest, must have read Luke chapter 18, verse 8, in which Jesus says, But when the Son of Man comes, do you think he will find faith on the earth? And St. Paul in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, joins in predicting the great apostasy just before the end. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, Jesus warns us then, because witness it will reach its peak, the love of most humans will grow cold. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, adds, Know also this, that in the last days shall come dangerous times. Men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, haughty, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, wicked, without affection, without peace, slanderers, incontinent, unmerciful, without kindness, traitors, stubborn, puffed up, and lovers of pleasure more than of God. Yet a learned Jesuit could not see the obvious, nor so many of his devotees today, including many highly educated persons. So why be surprised at the dullness of poor Galilean fishermen? In most of these cases, the reason for the lack of perception is clear. Some people establish a mental framework that will not allow any contrary idea to enter. Thus, Perrin believed so firmly in form criticism that he could not see what was so evident. The Hungarian doctors knew nothing about germs and so did not believe their own eyes, which saw the results in patients helped by Dr. Semmelweis. Chardin could not see the scripture passages that refluted his theory. And apostles shared the belief that the Messiah would be a glorious conqueror when Jesus tried to tell them the opposite. The idea did not penetrate at all. In, de in defense of the apostles, we must examine the command to teach all nations and separation of Christian Christianity from Judaism. We have spoken of the first of these two. As to the second, we must note that Christianity is really the fulfillment or completion of Judaism. Hence, a modern Jewish convert, Father Arthur Kleiber, likes to speak of himself as a completed Jew. Jesus himself insisted, too, in Matthew 5, verse 17, I am not come to destroy the laws and prophets, but to fulfill. St. Matthew loves to point out over and over how Jesus fulfilled prophecies. St. Paul in Romans 11 speaks of a tame and wild olive tree. The tame olive is the original people of God. Unfaithful Jews were branches of that people, but were broken off by their infidelity or rejection of Christ. In their place, the Gentiles were grafted as the new people of God, in continuity with the original people of God. St. Paul insists in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 9, that Christians are the true sons of Abraham, not by carnal descent, but by imitation of his faith. Quite naturally, then, the first Christians continued to frequent the temple while having their own baptism in Eucharist separately. Did Jesus, as Kung claims, 
never require membership of a church as a condition of entry into God's kingdom? In Matthew chapter 28, 19, the final words of Jesus are, Going, therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever have commanded you, Even the dull apostles grasped the command to baptize. So on the first Pentecost, the crowds, after hearing Peter, asked what to do. And Peter said to them, Do penance and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2, verses 37-38. Further, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 states, And they were persevering in the doctrine of the apostles and in the communication of the breaking of the bread and in prayers. All recognized the preeminent position of the apostles, but the rest no man dare join himself to them. But the people magnified them. Was the Eucharist just part of a long series of meals, just for fun, in uninhibited worldliness? and criminal irregularity, as Kung claims? First, the Last Supper was clearly a ritual meal, the observance of the Jewish Passover, and St. Luke makes clear, in Luke chapter 22, verse 11, within it, Jesus took bread, saying, This is my body, and the wine, saying, This is my blood. One does not act or talk, in such a serious manner at fun meals with uninhibited worldliness, Jesus also in the supper told them. Matthew 26, verse 20, and Mark chapter 14, verse 17. Amen, I say to you, that one of you is about to betray me. Hardly the way to have an inhibited celebration Nor would one know that he is about to die in a horrible manner, takes an interest in telling them just to continue these fun meals with, do this in memory of me. Kung also compares the church to the Dead Sea Scroll community in Qumran and finds in the church no elaborate setup of novitiate, initiation oath, long prayers, ritual meals, etc. We reply that the important consideration is that Jesus will provide the essentials. He told them to teach all nations. He promised that God would protect their teachings. He instituted a entrance rite, baptism, and told them to continue the Eucharist. He told them to insist on teaching authority, Matthew Chapter 18, verse 17. And if he will not hear the church, let him be to you as heathen and publican. For he had given them authority. Luke chapter 10, verse 16. He who hears you, hears me. And he who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. And God himself, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, says... Whoever you shall bind upon the earth shall bound in heaven, and whosoever you shall loose upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. True, there are no chancery offices in the apostolic church, but there were authorities. St. Paul, in what is probably the first written book of the New Testament, told the Thessalonians, Know those who labor among you and who are over you, in the Lord, and admonish you, and esteem them more abundantly in charity for their work's sake. First Thessalonians chapter five verse twelve. 